I'd like to uh, introduce to you today our speaker, uh, David Winogren, who is uh, Deputy Don CIO, and uh, he is in the CIO office dealing in the areas of e-commerce, uh, critical infrastructure protection, and information assurance. And um, he really knows lots about policy and what some of the Navy problems are and where the Navy is going and problems that the Navy is thinking about. And he's going to give us a, an overview of what's going on in the Don CIA office in those areas. All right. Well, good afternoon. It's great to be here. I have the coolest seat in the house because there's like actually breeze blowing through here. So. <laughs> Oh, no, please don't. I, mean, <laughs> I was going to say, you know, as, as you get farther up the rows, you, like, you begin to die from heat. So if you want to come down, it is cooler down here. It's great to be here. I understand we have like about 50 minutes together. So I'm going to talk really fast and uh, kind of walk you through some different things that are going on. But uh, you should all feel free to like, you know, interrupt and ask questions so we make sure that we use the time to your best advantage while I'm here. And if you see some things, we won't possibly be able to cover all the things I had on the slides here over the course of, of our time together. So I was going to just like kind of whip through some of them just to like sort of pique your curiosity. And I thought I'd end up with talking a little bit about some ideas I had about things that you all might be interested in if you're not already committed to a research project or a thesis that might be some areas that are like fruit for, uh, for work. And, uh, and again, if you see anything that I talked about that you're interested in talking more about, then come see me afterwards and we can talk more. I'll also give you my email address and phone number and all that kind of stuff so you can follow up afterwards. I, uh, it's, it's great to be here. I think you're all doing great work. We had a great VTC the other, the other day about some of the research work that you're doing in wireless vulnerabilities, and that was really great. And uh, so keep at it. And uh, you know, there's a lot of help that we need. And so we're all glad you're out here working so hard. Um, I was on my way out to that conference. It was, I guess it was a couple months ago now. I was out in San Diego, and, uh, and I was flying out on the plane, and I was thinking to myself, I wonder what I'll talk about when I get out there, you know, how that goes. And so I stopped a couple hours before the plane landed, and I had to really think about it. So I was reading the issue of USA Today, and I thought, well, I'm going to go through this one issue of USA Today. And I'm going to see how many stories I see in one issue of USA Today that are about how the Internet has changed everything. And I'm going to look for stories about Internet technologies and stuff and, and see what I come up with. And by the time the plane had landed a couple hours later, I found 15 stories in that one issue of USA Today that were about the Internet. In just one day issue of USA Today, which is really kind of neat. And they spanned the gamut of things. They were uh, you know, organic farmers using web technologies to display their wares to wholesalers so you could see the produce you were ordering. Uh, custom casket manufacturers that you can buy your custom coffin online. One of my personal favorites was a, uh, a casino out west that um, while you're in the casino and you're playing the slot machine, you can send emails to other patrons or make a lunch reservation or book a tea time all the while without ever stopping <laughs> and holding a handle, right? And, and, uh, and I th but I think my personal favorite was about religion online in America. And there was an article about how over 60% of American churches operate websites. And there was this great quote from a pastor. And he said, you know, in the past, my message used to reach 100 feet back to the sanctuary. And now my message can be heard in 100 countries around the world. And I thought, you know, what a powerful statement about how the world has changed. And so, you know, the C and CIO is really all about change. And that's what I seem to spend the majority of my time doing, helping people walk through that, you know, this really is a time of transformation. And there's this wonderful stuff that technology enables us to do that we couldn't do before. And then that leads you to something that you all care desperately about. And that's this sort of balancing, if you will, between, you know, security, and, uh, and transformational activity, right? And so I thought we'd maybe talk a little bit about that because, you know, there's this, there's this interesting balancing point that you need to find where you have to have people, you know, doing the right stuff from a security standpoint, but also progressing on in terms of trying new technologies and new solutions and making all that stuff happen. So with that, I'm going to, like, zip you through a bunch of slides, talk to you about some of them, just world past the other one. And I think, I guess what I'm going to do is, uh, what do you think? Do you think if I use the mouse here, will it make it go? Yes. All right. So, so the, like I said, the theme I have is the world is changing. And, and we're going to have all these slides available for you. So you'll forgive me if I only dance on some of them for a few seconds or so. But there's great stories up on this slide about how if you're interested in changing cost models, if you're interested in changing processes, if you're interested in setting up collaborative spaces, how internet tools and technology are enabling us to drastically drive down the cost of what it does to do banking, right? From going into a bank and, and dealing with a teller and, and it cost the bank over a buck for transaction. You know, we start talking about people's salaries and infrastructure. We move to ATM machines and the price gets cut in half, right? At which point one of you says, 
those of you in the back row that are dying from heat, you know, you don't say this, but the farther down you say, why does it cost me a buck and a half for my ATM transaction and if it's costing the bank half as much? And we would, of course, say, profit is an incredible motivator, is it not? <laughs> and if you're willing to pay it, they're willing to charge it to you. But the real key thing is, you know, if you're like me and you use, like, Navy Federal Credit Union online, you know, the cost is 100 of, uh, of the cost of doing a transaction in a bank. So, you know, using these technologies to drastically drive down cost models. I like this one over here because it talks about how the major automotive manufacturers band it together to form a common transport layer and then lay on top of it something called a digital marketplace that they call Covicent. So they're using, uh, you know, e-business kind of tools, online auctions and e-buying and that kind of stuff to drive down the price of cars. The shared transport layer with their common suppliers was driving down cars by like 71 bucks per car, but the, the e-business stuff from Covicent is estimated to be another $300 per car, which isn't a lot if you're just buying one, but if you're making millions of them, right, it begins to make a difference. But the thing I like about this story so much is like for DOD audience, you know, if like Ford, GM, and Chrysler can band together for common good without giving away competitive advantage, there is hope for all of us as we work together on <laughs> interoperable solutions in DOD. But people say, and then the last one on that is, of course, like when Pfizer realized they had a winner with Viagra and wanted to get it to market quicker, they pioneered, you know, a web-based process that speeded up time to market. But people say, you know, I expect this kind of stuff from, like, the Oracles and the IBMs of the world. Obviously, you know, they get this digital stuff and they want to make the world a better place. So I like this story about Simex. Want me to move you quicker? Well, it's up to you. I hate to, like, make you hang around, but if you want to, that'd be, like, really cool. Thank you very much. So, you know, so they say we expect IBM and Oracle to be, like, really slick about web technologies and stuff. So how about some other, like, sort of non-traditional folks? How many of you are familiar with Semex? Semex makes concrete in, like, 60 countries around the world. This is a story about Semex in Mexico. So you think about, like, concrete companies. You don't, like, think, like, you know, web techno meisters, right? But they're using, like, simple tools like GPS receivers and cell phones to drastically drive down cost and performance in terms of, you know, having just-in-time delivery of concrete where you need it, on the fly, and you can see some of the stats if you can read them, how they like, fundamentally changed what that means. Fewer trucks delivering more concrete and more profitability. So there really is like application for this stuff everywhere in every business that we do in the Department of the Navy. No, uh, but you know, so I thought like since it's hot in here, we would sort of like intersplice my talk with a you know a few little game show quizzes here, you know, and so to keep you lively and engaged with me here. And so you know, so it's like who wants to be a millionaire? But of course, this is like IT stuff, so millions aren't nearly enough, right? Billions are where we're going to be. So, so the quiz show for you all now is we're going to click once. I'm going to show you a national policy. And then your job is to tell me what country has these national policies. You ready? All right, so this is the first one. And if you can't read it, I'll just sort of highlight it for you. Uh, aggressive government policy to upgrade IT facilities and schools, intellectual property laws, strong microchip manufacturing presence, uh, local, domestic, long distance, and wireless access rates are lowest in the region. And your job is to guess a country. Boy, sometimes the flags don't even help, do they? Huh? <laughs> Costa Rica. All right, so now you, now you got the sense of this game. Huh? All right, let's do the next one. All right, official promotion of e-business, strength in intellectual property protections, digital signatures are legal. Now you're all gun-shy now, huh? You're like, a, uh, you know, like, a, all right, let's go ahead. All right, but hey, the flag helped, right? Korea, all right. I know. Slow down on me now. <laughs> he's, he's got a wild finger there. He's giving away the answers. All right, let's do the next one here. Heavy IT investment in, uh, in IT education, secondary schools connected through network computers, widespread popularity of internet-based learning, distance learning, which is a big deal for us. Anybody want to guess? Canada. Hungary. And then click it one more time. My favorite one is this last one. Approved proposal to guarantee internet access as a constitutional right for all citizens. <laughs> government says e-readiness is a national priority. Government offers free internet access points to eliminate the digital divide. And the digital divide is a big deal, right? I mean, that's a big deal here in the United States, let alone many other nations around the world, about those that have access to the internet and can use it. And the answer is Estonia. And so the world really is changing, and where the answers lie aren't always necessarily the places that you thought the answers were coming from before. Let's press on. Um, no, no talk about things that are going on in the Department of the Navy in the IT world would be complete without talking a little bit about the Navy and Marine Corps internet. But this could consume like, you know, an hour and a half easily. So I'm just going to do like 30 or 40 seconds on it, just from the standpoint about like security and access and that kind of stuff. Because, you know, this really is a big deal to us. Faced with that conundrum of, uh, you know, an aging IT infrastructure that we really have a hard time maintaining. 
as we looked around the world a couple of years ago, the, the Department of the Navy world, we saw that, you know, we thought we'd probably have to invest about $2 billion with a B to bring that infrastructure up to where it needed to be to really do the kinds of things that we imagine our shore establishment being able to do. Because when you look at a digital marketplace like Covicent, you see like 25,000 suppliers of stuff to the automotive manufacturers. And you look at the list of those names and you recognize them all. They're all companies that the Department of the Navy does business with, too. So you say to a Covis, and, well, this is really cool. You're like driving down prices, improving productivity by these kinds of tools. Could we become part of your digital marketplace and play there, too? And they would say, well, sure, as long as you're like, you know, you're like an internet savvy kind of organization, you know, you got like computers on your desktop, you got lots of bandwidth, can you? And, and the truth of the matter is, you know, we are kind of a mixed bag, are we not? I mean, we really do have commands that are haves and have nots in the department. And unfortunately, we typically have more have nots in our operational commands, which are the place where you ought to have more have. And so we really had this conundrum of uh, that coupled with our procurement system does a lot better job about buying the next aircraft carrier than it does about staying ahead of technology and refreshing quickly. So we had that kind of problem. We also had an IT workforce problem. We train them and then they go make big bucks in the industry, right? You become a network engineer and then you go off. And, and so we kind of accept that, that we do a lot of training for others to benefit from as a sort of a national good, if you will. But, but nonetheless, we already were outsourcing a lot of our IT network administrators. And so the NMCI construct is, is part of the way that we get around that. Because the idea of NMCI, for those of you that aren't that familiar with it, is that we're going to buy it as a service. It's like I want, you know, I want electricity coming into my house, I want bandwidth to my desktop, and I don't want to be the one that has to be responsible for buying all the stuff. So the NMCI thing is a contract that's a performance-based contract, firm fixed price, to do everything from get your computer that sits on your desk to the long haul connectivity, the help desks, and all that kind of stuff. And so it really is going to be a fundamental transformation for us. And, and I really think that you'll look back in a few years and say, this idea about having a really good computer and a lot of connectivity really brought the entire shore establishment to the place where you actually could be there with the operating forces and provide that kind of reach back that we never had before. We certainly never had when we had like the 100 disparate networks that didn't talk to one another and that kind of stuff. So um, let's go to the next slide. So the neat thing about NMCI, again, is this firm fixed price. And we didn't say, you know, I want Windows 2000, Dell computers and all that kind of stuff. We let industry decide how they would meet the performance. And the performance was like 37 service level agreements that did things like talk about security, your ability to thwart attacks on the network, latency, refresh rate. Over 50% of the incentive fees that the contractor can win are based upon satisfaction with the service as measured by the individual users. So the contractor team is heavily incentivized to provide you know, better, better, and better service as we go through the contract at a price for a seat, which a seat being you know, your computer set up at your desk, at a price for a seat that's fixed but goes down over the course of the eight years covered by the contract. These are the folks that, that are on the winning team. They've been in place for about a year now. Um, the first increment of 40-some thousand seats has begun cutting over to, a, you know, first thing they do, they come in, they see what you got, they take over your network as is, and then they eventually bring in their new equipment and get everything set up in the sort of to be state. And so that's happening. I think the, uh, before I leave, uh, just to say the neat thing was, again, that we didn't say, you know, it was going to to be Windows. We didn't say it had to be Dell. We let them choose what would best work to provide us, you know, I don't want to see an hourglass. I really want to be able to do security business transactions and be able to send that PowerPoint file to my friends in the Marine Corps that live in the room next door to me in my building in Crystal City that I couldn't send to before because, you know, conflicting firewalls and all that kind of story. Um, next slide. I think this is a picture of the first sailor sent in the first email on an NMCI workstation. You can uh, see it's a Dell computer with a smart card in the reader, and we'll get back to smart cards in a, in a few minutes. Um, it's going to pay some tremendous dividends for us in terms of once people have this access, what they can then do with it. Um, next slide. There, it has like also um, shown some payoffs in recent times too. I think we have to click, click once. You know, after September 11, we had about seven or eight hundred people that couldn't work in the Pentagon anymore because their spaces had been destroyed, and uh, and the Army did likewise, and, and to a lesser extent the Air Force too. And uh, the NMCI contract really paid some dividends for us. And so I thought I would like kind of read you some quick stats here. You know, that I, that I took from from when that happened. So right, the attacks took place on Tuesday. On Wednesday afternoon, we gave the uh, Information Strike Force team that's led by EDS, you know, that, that hey, hey, we need help. We got 800 people who don't have computers anymore. They don't have offices and stuff. And we need to get them connectivity. We need to do it fast. 
By Thursday morning, there were nine 18 wheelers on the road from St. Louis, Missouri, with the Dell equipment on board to get delivered. During the course of the day on Wednesday, we found an office building in Crystal City that had just gotten emptied out because of a base closure action. And, uh, and so we were able to like cut a deal to lease that office space. The, uh, the, the 18 wheelers had 860 laptops, 335 desktops, uh, enough Cat5 cable to outfit five floors of office space, and Cisco routers came from another truck, and they all converged on Crystal City. Next slide, there they are, they're on the go, and then the next, next click. And so, of course, that's the same office like two and a half days later. The equipment had arrived by Friday, and uh, over the course of the weekend, the ISF strike force had, uh, had gone in, and of course, you know, the, the building had been gutted. So they had to like string the wires again in the, in the walls. The computers had been shipped emergency shipped, so they didn't have the gold disk software. But over the course of that weekend, they got all that stuff taken care of. And on Monday morning, we had those 800 people up and running. You know, the Army, and this isn't like a bust on the Army, but I, just as an example, I mean, they were still struggling s days later because they didn't have this kind of vehicle, right? So they had to go, like, go buy computers and go set up arrangements for phone service and go set up, right, all the kinds of things that having this single integrated team working on for us paid dividends for us. So if my, if my boss, Dan Porter, the CIO, was here, he would tell you that he awoke one night in a cold sweat about a year ago and, and had, a, had a nightmare about NMCI. And so I said to him, well, so what was the problem? Because you know, this is different, right? It's a multi-billion dollar service contract, which makes people really ponder, because they think service contracts cut the grass, not service contracts for IT for 400,000 people, right? And so there was a lot of, a lot of um, interest, shall we say, on the part of members of Congress and the Office of Management Budget and otherwise. And so, I said to Dan, well, what happened? Did like, uh, you have a nightmare that Congress put restrictive legislation in place that kept us from doing NMCI? And he's like, no, 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 actually quite the contrary. You know, we got the approval to award the contract, which we did a year ago, October. And, uh, and it was like months later, and I was down at Toxin River, Maryland, which is one of the first sites that going to cut over to the new NMCI configuration. And I was standing behind a user as they were going to turn on their computer that first day. And do you know what I saw? The same thing I saw the day before. Nothing had changed. I mean, it all looked the same. And I was absolutely horrified, which is sort of like, you know, which is like sort of an interesting point to make, what NMCI is and what it's not. What it is is this sort of super highway system, right? You know, like to use a DC example, I used to have to travel down Route 1, lots of stoplights and stuff, and now I just built Interstate 95. But if you don't have a bunch of cool cars to like drive over the highway system, then you really haven't solved the problem, right? So you would imagine that when you have in place this new infrastructure, you have to at the same time be putting together like the applications and the products and the tools that allow people to do a bunch of neat stuff that they didn't do before. So he said, you know, well, the first thing I do is I could send Wintergren down there. He could go explain to them that like what NMCI is about is about access and interoperability and a common security architecture and all those good important things. But you know, you as a user were kind of like glazing over a few minutes ago, right? Because you're just kind of more interested in what I can I do present company excluded because of course you all care a lot about security but uh, but you know and, and it really is true though it's about like what can I do what can I launch and where can I go and so that's why I thought it was important to talk for a couple minutes about knowledge management this idea about setting up collaborative environments and giving each of you access to the authoritative data sources that you need to do your job and so there's lots of interesting stuff going on in the world you know, we have things like the knowledge wall that the folks at the War College created and, and a prototype on the Coronado that bring to bear all of the sort of powers from shore to give you intel, to give you weather, to give you all these kinds of things while you're out and deployed. You know, a lot of you probably know all about the collaboration of C tools, where the Carrier Battle Group used simple tools, again, chat rooms and those kinds of things, spreadsheets, but, but we're able to create, you know, the beginnings of common operating environments where all the watch officers could see information at the same time and work together using the same voice, video, images, that kind of stuff, and, and really sort of have that exchange of information going on all the time rather than just during the changeover of the watches. Next slide. The distance support portal at NAVC is this idea about things like telemaintenance. So you're on the carrier in the Pacific Ocean, and you're a maintenance technician, and you're looking at the part for the airplane, and what did you have for support in the past? You know, you had your supervisor, you had the tech manuals and that kind of stuff, but with the telemaintenance portal, you can reach back to Crane, Indiana, and actually talk to the engineer who designed that part. So this is an coll incredible collaboration that can take place. You know, whiteboard, voice, video, data, sharing, and now you've got the, sort of the power of all this technical expertise that lives thousands of miles away, and you're not alone anymore. Uh, the surgeon on the aircraft carrier can reach back to the National Naval Medical Center of Bethesda and do telemedicine. These are all like powerful tools to do distance learning. 
Right? So, so part of this coupling with a good infrastructure sure, is this ability to tie applications and experts to the folks who are deployed. E-business is really important to us. I have like a, some things I'm going to leave with the, with the gang here that I was going to ask you as you get a chance to try to take a look at for me. Some things I was going to ask you if you could like, uh, you know, put your intellectual powers to and give us some advice on how we can make them better. Uh, we have an e-business strategic plan that focuses on transformation. The big thing that's happening in the e-business world right now is you got like paper processes and you're going to change them. Right? So you're going to use technology to make it better. But lots of times what we do is we fall into that, that problem of, you know, we just take the process we had and we electronify it. And it was a really bad process before and it's still a bad process now. So, so our, our strategic plan kind of focuses on this idea about, hey, you know, if you're going to change a little bit, why not take this moment of opportunity to sort of transform yourself? If you're going to put the folks that you work with through a little bit of hassle, why not take this as the moment of opportunity to change your process, do some business process reengineering, and sort of think through a better way to do what you were doing? at sort of this moment of insertion of technology. Next slide. How many are you familiar with online reverse auction? Okay. So um, we did the first one in the federal government about a year ago, so we're kind of proud of that. We're an impatient bunch. You know, the Navy is like, is like def definitely wants to be a leader in the IT world. And, you know, NMCI, smart cards, uh, things like this e-business stuff, uh, we really sort of are, are, like, are reaching out. And uh, so online reverse auction, they're online. And they're reverse auctions because rather than bidding up the price you're willing to pay for something, like on eBay, you bid down the price that you're willing to pay, to, you know, to charge to do a service for it. So you're a contractor, and we'd like to have a building wired, and you're all going to participate in that auction. You're going to bid down. I'm willing to do it for a thousand. I'm willing to do it for eight hundred, till we reach the place where we pick the winner. It's this amazing way to sort of bring more competition into the process. We did the first auction, and it was for uh, ejector seat components that we were buying for the Air Force. And, uh, and the auction actually took place in Pennsylvania, but we, uh, we had a big, you know, it was the first online reverse auction in federal government history. So we had a big, giant conference room. We brought a lot of people in from all over DOD to watch this thing happen live, especially people from the Defense Logistics Agency and other places where they buy lots of commodities. And so we had everybody sitting down. And if you've ever done eBay, you know how this story goes, right? Because, you know, it's the three companies, and, and they agree to share pricing information. They don't get to see the other companies' names, but they get to see, like, Company A just bid, you know, a million bucks. And now company B's bidding, so you can see where you are in the process. And so, you know, we do the big spiel, and, and the auction's going to last a half hour, and it's time to start. And each of the three companies bids once. And then, like, nothing happens, you know? And so the, the poor guy is, like, up there, like, talking about this stuff. You know, he's got 150 people in the room, and he's like, well, auctions are really important. They're going to save us money and this kind of stuff. And, well, that took, like, 30 seconds, right? But, you know, this is, like, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And like you see in this picture, you can actually watch the auction take place, right? But like nothing's happening. I've got to tell you, standing in front of 150 people for 25 minutes while well, nothing's happening is a really long, long time. <laughs> but, but just like eBay, as it gets close to the end of the auction period, people start to bid, and, and there's a flurry of activity. By the time it was done, they'd actually save 28% over the price they pay for these same components from these same manufacturers within the last year. So there's this interesting thing about competition that happens here. They did like four more pilots. One of them was like a best value competition where they did not choose the lowest bidder. One of them was about um, opening up the marketplace to additional companies that hadn't participated before. The last one was for carriers, for aircraft berthing, and the incumbent contractor won, but for over 20% less than what they were currently charging. So this is an interesting dynamic, and it depends on where you sit on this, which side of the fence. You either think this is a wonderful way to like really inject competition in the procurement process, or else you're a company that says, well, you're eating my profit margins that kind of stuff. So it's probably not like a solution for everybody, but it really does have some potential to show how we can drive down our support costs by, by using some technology tools. We have an e-business operations up in Mechanicsburg. Uh, they're there to help folks go through this e-business transformation. And the neat thing about them is they actually have like pilot funding. So as you're here or you're in your next life and you're thinking about doing some of this e-business transformational work and you come up with a good idea but you just don't have the money to fund it, they're there and they can help you. They actually have like a $20 million pilot fund to help command do e-business solutions. Next slide. All right, time for the next quiz. All right, this time we're going to do the top information economies in the year 2001. And down here are the measures that were used to designate somebody as a top information economy. Computer infrastructure, information infrastructure, internet infrastructure, social infrastructure, which was sort of like the education level and like web savviness of the, uh, of the people in the country. Where do you think the number one country was? 
Sweden. All right, now, now I have a number two. It's a clue. It's on the same map. <laughs> Norway. And number three? Number three was Finland. <laughs> Finland's like sort of a fascinating, uh, a fascinating story, right? Because, you know, Finland, uh, Finland faced themselves with this horrible problem about they had no, like, copper infrastructure. Right? And so they're looking at like more and more <coughs> IT and phone service, all this kind of stuff, and how are we going to do it? And, uh, and they're thinking, you know, gazillion dollars to bury cables under the ground, and, and then they're looking around the rest of the world, moving from copper to fiber optic. And, and they finally said to themselves, well, wait a minute, you know, what about like wireless? You know, why don't we just go to like wireless technologies and just like leapfrog an entire generation of technology? And so if you've ever been to Finland, you know, you, this is like this true story. You can actually take your cell phone and dial the number on a vending machine, dispense a soda, and have it bill your cell phone account. I mean, so by, by like thinking to the next level of technology, they've actually like, they never had to go dig those tunnels and put in all that the cable and stuff. And so, you know, <laughs> wireless vulnerabilities aside, you know, I mean, it's sort of an interesting thing about what, what goes on, right? That's what I'm thinking, note yeah. to self, head to Finland. There you go, there you go, that's right. And number four, the United States. The United States was first in computer infrastructure but scored lower in the top 10 in all three of the other categories. They're just very interesting, interesting facts. There's nothing else you can use these to win a beer at a bar later on, you know, half hour bets or something. All right, next slide. I had to use this slide because Emory made it for me when he was working with me back in D.C. So yeah, you like all the special effects in there, you know? <laughs> all right, so, so of course, you know, one of the reasons we're here today is because security is important to all of us. And uh, I have this great job because I get to have like both security and e-business in my job title, right? So I get to care about like doing really cutting edge transformational stuff and I also care about like trying to do it right in a secure way that doesn't like thwart all the kinds of stuff that we're trying to do, like defend the nation, right? And, uh, and it is really a fascinating conundrum because you know how it is, right? I mean, ultimate security is what? Total isolation, right? <laughs> and so we, we actually have that like continuing debate. I, I saw it happen a couple of years ago. You know, we were getting a lot of virus activity during the Y2K days and that kind of stuff. And, and there were a lot of proponents in DOD that were saying, there is an answer. You know, we can just wall ourselves away. You know, we just wall ourselves off from the Internet. We don't talk to anybody that doesn't have a .mil or a .gov address. You know, we'll all be safe, and those nasty viruses from the Philippines won't be able to get in. And at the time, you know, we're thinking about telemaintenance, telemedicine, distance learning, and we're thinking, man, you know, they have a name for that, right? You know, it's called a self-inflicted denial of service attack, right? I mean, you just, you, you know, nobody can get in, but you can't get out and do anything. And so there's got to be better answers. There's got to be ways to make sure that we fully consider security, but at the same time allow ourselves to take advantage of these new technologies in a sane way. And so, you know, we continue to kind of fight that battle because the immediate knee-jerk reaction sometimes is to say, well, you know, just don't do it. Just don't do it, rather than... Here are the vulnerabilities. Now, how do we start to address those vulnerabilities so we can take advantage of them? Right? I will footstop that story a couple times. We're talking about wireless, because, and, and this is no bust on the wireless work you guys are doing out here, because I think it's really great. But it reminds me of a, you know, in the Pentagon. You know, oh my gosh, wireless security vulnerabilities. What are we going to do? And the immediate thing is we're writing a memo that says we'll have a moratorium on no new wireless devices in the Pentagon. Now that sentence was important because I said no new wireless devices in the Pentagon. So like you know so. I'm okay, because I got mine last week, but you can't have one next week when you come. And they're like, well, well wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not sure I understand this, because it's either, it's either bad to have this or not. You know, it's not just bad for you to have it, but not me, and, and those kinds of things. But sometimes we make like, those sort of knee-jerk responses that we have to deal with. I, uh, uh, like I said, I, perhaps I put some too long on that, but, but there's a reason for that. Because there are things out there that allow us to do things more securely while not thwarting this ability to do business. And that's why... PKI is so important today. And so, of course, you're all like PKI zealots, so, you know, so that's good, right? Because usually when I talk to a crowd like this, I say, how many of you are familiar with PKI? And a few of them raise their hands. And then I tell everybody else in the room, see who they are, remember their faces, and after this is over, take them to a bar, buy them a beer, and make them tell you about this, because it's really boring, dry stuff about, you know, prime numbers and mathematical equations. And the, but that's not true for all of us, because we know about the fascinating stuff that goes on in a PKI world, right? PKI is really as crucial for us, because if you think about it, that ability to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that it really is Dave Wondergren that sent you the email, or that I can encrypt the information I send you so it doesn't really matter whose phone lines it travels over, or the fact that I can sign a contract and, and through hashing and that kind of stuff, you can prove that I signed it and that nobody has touched that document since I signed it. 
are really like the only way that you could ever do e-business, right? I mean, because if you can't like guarantee those kinds of things, then you're just like, you know, it's like you said, go to Finland, make a million bucks, right? And so, so PCAS is really important to us, and, and of course, next slide. You know, the, the challenge that we had was in the beginning, people wanted to give you all software diskettes. Right, we're gonna have software certificates on diskettes, and you can just imagine what that would have been like, you know. I got like 800,000 people to worry about in the Department of the Navy. You know, there's like three and a half million users that were gonna get these things across all DOD. You know, number one, software certificates aren't nearly as secure, right? Memories train me well, you know. The private key material is living on my computer hard drive, and it's easy enough to hack in and get it, right? And so I don't really want it on my hard drive. But also, can you imagine the logistics of passing out four million discounts? You know, and, and knowing that this one's mine, this one's yours, and you know, all that kind of stuff. Fortunately for us, there was something that we do very well in DOD, right? And that is like badges, right? <laughs> we do badges so well. I got a couple of them here on me. I think you know, we got like a badge for this and a badge for that, and a badge to get in the gym in the Pentagon, right? We know how to issue badges. And that, of course, is a form factor that you can use for PKI too. Hence, a lot of enthusiasm for smart card technology. Because the chip on the smart card gives you that ability to store those digital credentials in a form that's easy to like give out to folks. We make you all get a military ID card, right? We not only make you get a military ID card, but then we give you like a badge to get on the base too, because God forbid we trust you that you got a military ID card, and so we give you another badge too. And that's the next thing I'll put stuff about in a couple of minutes about some of these false perceptions we have about what makes it secure for you. But of course, you're you all familiar with smart cards, right? How many of you have a common access card? Anybody yet? Well, you will. That's the new DOD common access card. It's the new military ID card. It's going to be the civilian ID card. And this is it. This is what it looks What's like. time frame for this one? They, uh, they're rolling out now. We've given out uh, over 80,000 common access cards in DOD, 70,000 of them to Department of the Navy folks, because we imagine this as part of NCI for you. You saw this screen. I mean, you know, we want you to have a smart card with digital certificates that you use to get on your computer and then use the certificates to sign emails, go to secure websites, and that kind of stuff. So we're clearly leading the DOD pack in terms of giving them out. But the idea is over the course of the next two years, every active duty person, every selected reservist, every government civilian, and every on-site contractor will have a, a, a DOD common access card. And if you want to see what one looks like, he goes, is he going, well, that one's mine. I also have one, I think, yeah, I got like a one that you can all take a look at if you want to see what they look like. I used to have an American Express blue card with a chip in it that I passed around to folks, and it didn't come back at the end of the night. Like, <laughs> if you want to pass it around, look at it. This is what this is what it's going to look like. But it, the neat thing about it is it's got a lot of technologies on it. You know, it's got the smart card chip. It's also got mag stripes and barcodes, so you can use it for a number of different kinds of technology. I'm talking fast. I haven't lost you that though, right? Got lots of things I want to tell you about, so I'm moving fast. But you know, jump in. So we've been using smart card technology for years in the Department of the Navy. We like actually are kind of recognized as a as a leader in the U.S. for smart card stuff for business applications, right? You got like processes where people stood in line or filled out paperwork, and you can use the power of that little computer chip on the card to automate those processes. What really became a neat thing though is when PKI happened and the chips became a little bigger and stronger and they had cryptographic coprocessors on it and so you could begin to use these chips to do PKI as well. And uh, so if you're a recruit and you go to Great Lakes now, you get your first, you get your smart card before you get your first haircut. You have money on it to do your initial outfitting at the exchange. You use it to check out guns, to get into the galley, get your shots and those sorts of things. So business processes, the, uh, the George Washington Carrier Battle Group deployed with them. Last time they went out, used them for quarter deck access to get on and off the ship. Use them to issue tools, use them in a Wahoo. So there's a lot of people using smart card technology already. In fact, smart card is kind of a fascinating technology because there's like 2 billion smart cards or so in the world right now. And there's only, I don't know, 20 or 30 million in the US. It's clearly one of those technologies that caught on in the rest of the world before here. And I think that's probably because of like credit card mentality that we have. We're all used to credit cards, they're fairly ubiquitous. In other parts of the world, credit cards were not so ubiquitous. So this idea about having a chip where you could store value and use it like debit card transactions was really big. The other big thing was uh, cell phones in Europe, GSM phones that use smart card chips. So like have it, you know, the chip is in it and it's my phone. I take my chip out, I put yours in, and now it's your phone and it builds your account, that kind of stuff. Next slide. The problem with smart cards was in the beginning, people had this idea about you're going to put lots of stuff on that chip. I'm going to put your shot records on that. And then somebody else said, well, that's really cool if I can put your shot records on there. How about if I put your demo records on there, too? And of course, the chips aren't that big, right? I mean, they start out like, they're like computer processors. They double, but they're like 2K, then 4K, then 8K. The one that I'm passing around, the one that they're using now is 32K. So it doesn't fit a lot of stuff on it, right? 
And so it's one of those great like cases where the more successful you were, the more you were bound to fail, right? Because I put your shot records on here, and then you said, well, I'd like my dental records. And I said, well, the chip's not big enough. I'll have to go buy a new car, right? And then you put the medical records on, and somebody wants to put your personnel records on. So it was kind of this like self-inflicted torture. But also, you ran into this problem about, I don't really know that I want all of your records to be on a card, right? Because then like you lose the card, or you know, your, your version of it doesn't match what's in the great database in the sky. So as we looked around at what industry was doing, we, we really said there's a better path. And that is that you want to use this card as a key to access websites that have transactional-based web-enabled applications that live on them. And rather than have your personal records sitting on the card, what I'd like to do is to set up a secure session that says, you know, this is Wintergren. I'm authenticating him through his certificates. He's allowed to look at his personal record. He's not allowed to look at his personal record, those sorts of things. So I don't want to put lots of data on the card. And so our strategy is really minimalist now. You want your certificates on these cards. You want some basic demographic information about you and the things that are required because it's a Geneva Convention card. And then all the rest of the stuff is about access rights and access privileges to go to do web transactions. So that's sort of like where we are with smart cards. We're not alone. Lots of stuff going on. I mentioned American Express Blue. Why were they willing to give away uh, free readers, 0% annual fee, uh, zero annual fee, zero dollars annual fee, zero percent interest rate. I sound like a shill for American Express. If you act right now, but uh, right, why, were they, why were they willing to do that? It was because it was about fraud, right? I mean, what they said was they said to internet providers of uh, products, they said if you accept American Express Blue and the PKI technology and SSL and all that kind of stuff, we'll know that people's credit card numbers aren't getting snatched on the way to your site. So we'll charge you a lower transaction fee. You'll make money. We'll make money because we'll be paying less in fraud and that kind of stuff. And it's worth it to them to give you a reader. Entire nations are doing it. Spain has given a smart card to every citizen. Go to the post office, get your smart card with PKI on it. Target's going to replace its credit cards with smart cards. Other countries, Sweden, uh, Finland, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Switzerland, Canada, Ministry of Defense, the United Kingdom. Ministry of Defense. Next slide. My favorite one, perhaps, is you know, China, planning on 750 million smart cards. Right? <laughs> so man, you know, people fret about rolling out a couple million here in DoD. You know, imagine that. So anyway, so we're not alone in this technology, and and like I said before, it is coming coming to a town near you. So uh, at some point over the next year or so, depending on where you are, where you get stationed next, you'll uh, you'll be getting the new. The new military ID so card. The new uh, president of uh, what is it, Oracle is trying to give this away. Yeah. He's dovetailing on the recent events. He's trying to yeah. give it away to the whole right. country, essentially, initially. Yeah, I was, uh, I was going to mention that. Yesterday, I was up at Sun in San Jose, and Scott McNeely, the CEO, was talking to us for a while. And uh, you know, he, he and Larry Ellison are like really you know, advocating this idea about national ID card, which is really a tough subject. right? Because when we went to, I went to Norway to ask them about smart card technology once. And uh, we just come from Spain, and so you know, Spain national ID card, Finland national ID card, and we said to the folks in Norway, so are you, you know, what are you doing? And they're saying, well, we're going to have this voluntary system where you can get PKI smart cards to do business with public utility companies and stuff like that, but we're not going to mandate it for people, you know, because we had a national ID card like from 39 to 45, and we, you know, when they were occupied by the Nazis, and we're never going to do that again. So national ID cards are really like touchy subject. Uh, Scott McNeely says he gets like more hate mail, hate email now than he ever has in his life from being, you know, advocating a national ID card. People are calling him like, you know, Nazi, big brother, you know, all this kind of stuff in it. And, and you know, and the problem with him, if you've ever seen him talk, he's like an extremely passionate guy and he's really like intense, you know. And so, you know, you can sometimes misconstrue the things you hear him saying because he had like a, he had a great thing. He said, uh, you know, we're willing to put chips in our dogs but not in our kids, you know, and so, right, I mean, you know, about dogs, right, like my dog has the little chip and they insert it in the back of the dog's neck and then if the dog gets lost, the Humane Society scans it, right, and you, and you get your dog back and you're like, we're willing to put chips in the back of our, our neck of our dogs but not in our kids, what are we worried more about losing, and, you know, and that kind of stuff, and of course, you can see how people might misconstrue that, right, but, and then I found out you guys had already, somebody had already done a thesis about putting chips in people's necks out here, so you guys are right on the cutting edge, but this really is a big debate, because, <laughs> right, because you, you can imagine, the, the thing that he was proposing, though, is kind of interesting, because he was, he, being a free market kind of guy, he's imagining, like, letting the competitive marketplace deal this, like, what would it be worth to you if, like, remember back in the old days, maybe, a, maybe I don't, you know, maybe you're all too young or something, but, you know, you used to have, like, 
Sometimes they had like non-smoking sections on planes. Sometimes they had smoking flights and non-smoking flights. And you chose. And of course, people chose in mass to go on non-smoking flights. And that's the way the market kind of weeded itself out of smoking flights. So he said, like, what would it be worth to you if I said, you know, the national ID card isn't mandatory, but I'm going to give you this card that allows you to authenticate yourself, and we'll have two lines at the airport, you know? The one that you go through with your ID card that's, like, quick and easy, or the one where you, you know, stand in line like this for, like, a half an hour <laughs> while they're, like, doing this to you. Or, even better, we'll have two planes. You know, the, the 9 a.m. flight is all people who have authenticated themselves. The 10 a.m. flight is people who won't authenticate themselves. And which flight are you going to go on, right? And if you made some strategic business choices like that, you might actually get people's acceptance. Because it's fascinating to think about, this debate is really about emotions, right? Because you think about, like, the financial world. How much information you're willing to just give away about yourself, right? I mean, what does your bank know about you? And, and everybody else that, you know, uh, you want a car loan? I'm going to, like, call the number, and 30 seconds later, I'm going to know more about you than, you know, you ever imagined. And, and that's okay with you, right? You made a conscious decision that that was okay because that was the way you got car loans. And then we suggest you know, a national ID card to you, and people get very nervous about that. So it is sort of about you know, mindsets and stuff. But the national ID card is a great debate. I was going to suggest that as like something somebody could work on out here. OK, moving along. I want to talk about critical infrastructure protection for a little bit, because it's sort of tangential. I have a, a critical infrastructure protection team at, at the CIO organization, the information assurance team. And, and of course, the information assurance team imagines himself as this like, really unique discipline that you know, is very important. And the, the SIP team imagines the IA folks is just like another subset of their world, right? They care about all the infrastructure protection, right? Utilities, transportation systems, information systems, and stuff. So it's kind of an interesting dynamic. This is a, from a book called The Sword and the Shield. And, uh, and this is what like, the KGB was interested in, which is oftentimes different than what we think about protecting. And so this idea about critical infrastructure protection, or understanding where your vulnerabilities are, and how you run your bases, and what you rely upon off of your base to get your mission done, is really kind of an interesting subject, especially in light of the events of recently. And so next slide. So, so what we're finding out as we're going around the, the nation and looking at, at our big bases and stuff is, you know, look at op plans, look at what the mission for this base is if we mobilize, and where are our vulnerabilities and single points of failures. And you often find some really interesting stuff because it's not where people imagine it is. So like if you're down in, I don't know, pick a town, Norfolk, Virginia, and you know, you have reason to believe heightened terrorist activity. Telcom, you know, targeted. So, so you're the base commander. What do you decide to do? You know, do you put more guards at your perimeter? Well, you might, unless you realize that you know the single point of failure for telecom is not on your base, and it's not at Langley, and it's not at Fort Eustis. It's down someplace in downtown Norfolk, where both the bless their hearts, the people who set up the primary switch network and the people that set up the redundant path didn't talk to each other, and they both ended up in the same building. And so, you know, if you knew about this, you could just blow up that building, right? And so all the guards back there, the sub peers wouldn't have done anything to protect against that problem. But if you know about that, right, if, you're, if, you're, if there's a bridge, it's a, I'm telling you like true stories, but I'm changing the names of the locations, right? If you, there's a bridge that 100 trucks are supposed to drive over every day if we mobilize to offload ordinance, and the bridge is outside of the view of the gate. And so if you, know, if you think through that kind of stuff, then maybe you put like a camera on the bridge, because the bridge is also where the water and the electricity and the phone lines all come in too. Maybe if we mobilize, you know, you put guards out there to guard the bridge. If you understand where these vulnerabilities are, then you can begin to do stuff about it. We have a great dependence upon the private sector. Weapon system support is like almost completely non-organic now for a lot of our weapon systems. And so you as the program manager for a certain missile system think you got everything under control, but you're not talking to the other nine missile systems that we have and realizing that all these things come together in one manufacturing plant or, or one shipping point. And so if you can understand that kind of stuff, you can really do something about it. One of the tools that I was going to ask some folks if they're interested in to look at is a self-assessment tool that we put together. With the idea being that, you know, if you're in a big region, we send out teams of folks to look at force protection, anti-terrorism, and, and all that kind of stuff. But if you're in, like, Crane, Indiana, or Millington, Tennessee, or someplace, you know, you're not going to get this big team for a long time. So if you had a tool that lets you assess this stuff for yourself, then, you know, you can sort of be a step ahead of the game. So with all these tools, I'm really interested in some feedback about what we could do to make them better. All right, next slide. Let's go down the home stretch here because I want to, like, uh, kind of finish up with a couple of ideas for you. Um, hey, one last quiz. We're going to move from countries to cities now. So you get one last quiz, and then you're off the hook for the last few minutes of our talk together. So these are, like, the recognized intellectual capitals. There's no pun intended. They're not all capital cities. That'll be my first clue for you. And your job is to try to guess. Where do you think the uh, intellectual capital for venture capital is in the world right now? New York City? 
Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cambridge, UK. Next Generation Wireless, you know where this one is. Come on. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> they remembered, all right, that's great. Smart cards. Montrouge, France. Almost every major manufacturer of smart cards is headquartered in France. It's like makes people like from NSA crazy, you know? They're like, oh man, you know. <laughs> Foreigners making our smart cards and stuff, but uh, but but that's sort of the beauty of like picking like industry standard interoperable solutions because I mean we're using like the same kind of security structure that like all the banks are using and, and are happy with and stuff and so you know where the plastics made isn't maybe necessarily as big a deal. Interactive Television is Milan, Italy, Biotech, Munich, Germany, and Encryption, Belgium. They're all they're all in Europe. So again, it's sort of like an interesting thing about where the power of change is happening around the world. Next, next slide. Web enabling is really important to us. Along this idea about having their fast cars that drive on MCI, we imagine web enabling our existing legacy applications over the next several years, moving them to the web. And, uh, and then we'll talk about the power of accessing them. So um, with a lot of this stuff, it's about moving with speed. You know, you heard the story about like internet time, right? It's like dog years, you know, like seven internet years to one, one, you know, one real year, right? And, that's the speed of pace of change. And so if you're like a so if you're like a government person, you know, and you're like going, well, I really like to do this like web enabled transaction model, you know, and but I got a palm for it. You know, and I can get it in a budget and then I'm imagining I'm gonna get it going in like two years. And you say that to somebody like in the sort of dot com world, they would look at you and they would say, seven times two is never. I mean, <laughs> the world will change so much in two years, right? You know, I mean, the technology changes, people change. And so the systems we see that have the most problems right now are those that start and then go and go and go. And seven years later, you're still waiting for the defense travel system to deliver the goods. You know? <laughs> that was a hypothetical example, of course. <laughs> but, uh, but, right, but the places where we're seeing the most benefit is where people say, 100 days, I'm going to put something into place. It's not going to be perfect. I'll have to fix some of it. Right, but and that's where we're seeing like good transformational stuff happening. How long was that MCI going to take? We imagine. Well, we imagine like a a year and a half from now, we'll have all four hundred thousand of this stuff. You know, NMCI is like an interesting interesting conundrum because NMCI is not about the ability of technology to work, nor is it about the ability of like EDS to put into place the answer. NMCI is about cultural change. The biggest problems that we have with NMCI is, you know, people, we'll, we'll name hypothetical names again, people on the staff of the Office of the Secretary of Defense who view this as like something like, well, this has got to be like an acquisition program that demands all this oversight before I allow you to take any action. And then you immediately get tangled into debates about policy decisions. As we said, for example, like DISA, Long Haul Services, we said to the teams that bid on NMCI, we will give you DISN free. We'll pay for DISN and you get to use it for your long haul service. Now, you know, your deal with us is service level agreements. You provide service, this kind of consistency, this kind of, and that's how you get paid. So, you know, your choice. If you don't believe that the DISN can meet your needs, then, you know, feel free to go pick an alternative solution. Every company that bid on it bid an alternative solution, even though the DISN service was free to them. Right? It was, it was worth more to them to be able to use, like, MCI WorldCom for circuits than to deal with some of the service level problems that we have. And so, you know, this is not like, it's not hard to get like a new Dell computer in any of Washington. It is really hard to convince depot workers that, you know, somebody might lose a job, right? Because they get like hung up on like, I have 10 network administrators at NADEP Jacksonville, and you know, they don't have a job anymore. And what the heck are you gonna do about it? And so therefore I don't want it. And they fail to think about 3,000 workers in NADEP Jacksonville that have a whole lot more productivity enhancing tools than they had before that allow them to like make themselves more competitive and stay in business, right? And so you go through this like tortured debate about, you know, what do you get out of it? What's it going to cost you? What do you pay now? And so all of our problems that take time to get NMCI implemented, seriously, have been about trying to deal with those change things. So. And it has been tortured. So tortured last year that Congress actually put legislation in place that said you can't do NMCI for the first year at NADEX or shipyard. I mean, that's specific. Oh, go ahead, try MCI. We won't let you do more than 15% of it. You know, do these kinds of things. You know, bend over, jump up and down, do this kind of stuff. Come back to us, show us that it works, and then we'll let you do another. Bit. So it's really more about that sort of cultural change issue. I have a, I have a, I have a little video that I show lots of times before I talk. 
it's like a bunch of clips from industry about like what you can do with technology, and they're, like they're funny, you know, they're like the IBM commercials and stuff like that, where you know the refrigerator knows it needs to be fixed before it breaks and that kind of stuff. But the last thing I have is a little clip from Indiana Jones and the Last Lost Crusade. Last Crusade. I don't know if you remember that movie, but right, you know, he's looking for the Holy Grail, and he's and he's going up the path, and he gets to the place where there's the big chasm in front of him, right, and and you know, and it's no no way across, and the little book he has says, you know, it's a leap of faith. Right, and so he stands there for a while, and eventually he puts his foot out, and he steps in there. Really, is a walkway that he can see, and that is really what this is all about. This is about transforming ourselves, and you've got to be willing to take that leap of faith. And and as a and as a culture, as a group, we're not always ready to do that. Right? I mean, we really are like much happier because of the sort of negative incentives that we put in place for ourselves about failure is not an option. Right? That that we don't want to take those chances sometimes, and that's really what this stuff is all about. It's about being able to take that step. So I'm going to try something new and, and try to see if it works. There you go. That was a big soapbox limit. Oh, wait, wireless. We've got to zip through this because you know about wireless. But, but we see this happening more and more. People are going to be what they call nomadic workers. And that became evident, you know, on September 11th again, right? I mean, I could not. I was at, a, I was at Fort McNair, which is in the district, when the Pentagon was attacked. My office is in Crystal City, but I had, like, lots of people that were over in the Pentagon at meetings that morning. I could not use a phone on Fort McNair. The switch was down. I could not use my cell phone because the system was immediately overloaded. The only way I knew that the people that worked for me that were, were okay was because they had Blackberry. And they could, they could talk to me. And I, and I knew they were there. And, and so you see more and more of this. I go on travel. I take a wireless tool with me. I, I, I'm from home. This idea about people being able to work from wherever they are is something we're going to have to deal with. And so what we need to do is to figure out ways to do that smartly. One of the suggestions I would have is we were talking about before we walked in is a, like smart card technology, right? If I have something like a BlackBerry and it has a smart card reader, and I could use my PKI digital certificate to encrypt the information that I'm sending over the, the wireless transmission, that does a little bit to help my concern about people snatching what I'm doing. And so we've got to think about how do we actually do these kinds of solutions in a way that allow us to press on. Because if we don't, you know, we will be like the only people, I mean, 802.11b, bad, bad, you know. And so we've got to like, help people develop a better wireless standard, right? But we also got to think about, you know, if we don't use like PDAs and stuff like that, we will be like the only people in the world that don't. Right? And so, you know, everybody else will be figuring out ways to leverage those technologies for, for advancement, except for us. So. All right, let's see right down home stretch. People using palms all over the place. We have no time for these stories now, but landing support officers using palms and lots of applications like that. I love this photograph. It has nothing to do with my brief, but, but I just thought it was a great photograph of the carrier in the background, the guy from the telecom <laughs> All right, work with me here. All right. <laughs> Safeway in the United Kingdom, right? Safeway in the United Kingdom, Safeway said, I want to help, I want to like make it be a cool IT company. And so I want to let people do stuff differently. So I want to let them like buy their groceries from home and stuff like that. But my favorite one is you walk into the store, you pick up a barcode scanner, as you walk through the store, you put stuff in your cart, you scan it. Right? You scan in the stuff as you put it in. And then when you get to the end of the store, you hang up your barcode reader on the wall and you walk out the door. And you didn't stand in line, and you didn't write a check. And what do you think? Good idea or bad idea? <laughs> See, this is, this, is, this is like perfect example, right? Some people say great idea. Some people say bad idea, right? And what it really is about, it's about a change in trust model, isn't it? Because Safeway said to themselves, this is worth it to me to have thousands of customers, you know, be able to, to have something that was more convenient and better for them, right? And, and I would risk like, having people shoplift, right? If you think about any sector of the retail market that cannot afford loss, it's the grocery store business, right? They cannot afford shrinkage. I mean, because the markup rate on grocery products is so little. You just can't afford to have stuff walking out the door in a grocery business. But yet they were willing to make that change in trust models. And that is kind of like a fascinating thing that we all have to walk ourselves through. All right, let's get to the end of this so I can tell you like one last story. So imagine an enterprise portal. It's good to tell you this just for a second because I want to talk a little bit about work. When you come on NMCI, you have a portal that has web-enabled applications hanging behind it, right? And so what I'm doing is I'm authenticating myself to the portal, and then the portal has trust relationships with applications. So from my desktop, I can do the kinds of tasks that I need to do from wherever I am. So, so we got this idea about wherever you are, you now have sort of the, the ability to reach back to all the folks that, that are out there that can do really great things to like help support our deployed forces, whether it's telemedicine, telemaintenance, whether it's something as simple as sending an email home to your family while you're deployed. Okay. How many of you remember Rosie Ruiz, Boston Marathon? Mm -hmm. You remember yeah. she like she like got on she the did. subway, right? 
she, so, so I don't want you to leave here and say, like, Wendergren talked really fast for 55 minutes, and then, like, he ended up telling us to go cheat. <laughs> because, like, cheating is bad, right? But, but there's a fascinating thing about this story that, you know, the times have changed a lot. And we talk about the trust models like Safeway in the United Kingdom, or the IBM commercial where the guy's putting the stakes in his jacket, and, you know, and the security guard goes, excuse me, sir, you forgot your receipt, because, you know, they were being, like, scanned by, you know, the IT technology and that kind of stuff. And, and so we really are kind of running a different race now. So I thought, like, totally gratuitous and unsolicited here, I was thinking as I was driving down here, like, what were some ideas? What were some ideas about things that I'd be interested in, in like, you know, knowing more about and research work and that kind of stuff? So if you're all, like, got things you're working on, like, you can just snooze for the next minute and a half as I tell you this story. If you're interested in any subject areas, I think they're all subject areas that are, like, growth industries for us where like the work that you would do would be things that people would like have practical applications for immediately. So let me just like zip through a couple of them. PKI would clearly have done a good job of, of what it means to issue certificates to people. Would clearly have gobs more work to do about the I, the infrastructure part of PKI. And this idea about you know directory services and certificate revocation lists and what that means in an enterprise with four million users and thousands of people doing transactions at the same time and bandwidth issues associated with that. This idea about enterprise portals, and uh, so like, you know, what kind of security gains and cost avoidances do I achieve by, rather than having a strategy that says every one of my application owners individually, PKI enables, web enables, all this kind of stuff to their individual applications, that we like join together in, in a portal strategy, where all you gotta do is make sure that your application has a relationship with the portal, and the portal does the heavy lifting of authentication work, making sure the user is, is a valid user and that kind of stuff. In the critical infrastructure protection area, there's a bunch of stuff. You know, this idea about the self-assessment tool and where it could go and how it could morph and modeling and, and wargaming and all that kind of stuff, our infrastructure vulnerabilities. Uh, indications and warnings and how we integrate across all the sources that give us warnings now into really sort of an integrated picture. Weapon systems and reliance on non-organic support. We talked a little bit about that. You know, there's one place that makes all the batteries that we need in our weapon systems. The one place. And it's not even like protected, you know. And, and if it was like blown up, you would have no batteries. <laughs> For you know, and, and so if you understood that kind of stuff, then you would like protect it a little bit better, right? And that kind of stuff. Um, the other thing that's interesting about SIP is this whole idea about you got this like great public policy conundrum, because you have like mandates for greater reliance on the private sector, and you got uh, mandates to reduce costs, so we get rid of redundancy. You know, we, we regionalize, we consolidate, all this kind of stuff. So in, in all aspects of my job, getting rid of redundancies is good, except when I talk to my SIP team, where, of course, getting rid of redundancies is really bad, right? Because then you're back to single points of failure. And so how do you make that sort of public policy space get navigated? COOPs, continuity of operation plans in the 21st century, is a, is a real big deal, right? We did a lot of COOP stuff in Y2K, but the world's sort of changing, and the sort of the assumptions that go into continuity of operations are changing. Like, think about, like, post 9-11 and after 9-11, right? Lots of people's COOPS plans were, I'm going to go to the backup site. You know, move people and equipment and go to a backup site if I can't operate out of where I am. Right, well, what if it's like a, you know, what if it's like an anthrax or something and I'm quarantined people? Or it's like, you know, planes crashing in the building, so I shut down the air travel system and nobody can go anywhere. So what it means to do continuity of operations in this sort of new world is, is really, I think, some food for thought. Uh, privacy. There's a fascinating juxtaposition of privacy and information assurance, right? Because you're an information assurance person, you kind of think, the more I know about you, the more I can protect ourselves, right? And so, and then if you're a privacy advocate, you kind of say, well, there's, you know, I don't know that I want everybody to know everything about me. And so there's an interesting thing. In some cases, privacy works really well with security. In some cases, it doesn't. And one of the papers I have up here kind of talks through how those things work together. You know, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said that, uh, Private, the privacy you expect is the privacy that you get. So if like, you're a DOD user, you, know, you see that banner every day that you may not read. But it says, you know, you have no stinking privacy. You know? I reserve the right to look at everything you do anytime I want. You know? And so you have a different expectation of privacy as, as a member of DOD than you do if you're a private citizen doing business with government. Smart cards, we talked about the national ID card issue. But that's got some fascinating policy conundrums that it, it deal with it. Wireless, this idea about you know, how do we deal with security vulnerabilities while still allowing ourselves to do some kind of market penetration of secure technologies, biometrics, issues about reliability, best use, and, and, and you know, storage of the minutia and that kind of stuff. And you, know, you really don't want my fingerprint living on somebody's server unencrypted, because you know, I can change my password if you get it. 
So it's damn hard to change my fingerprint if you get that from me, right? And so uh, information assurance, risk management strategies. You know, we talked a little bit about on the way over here about that. You know, how you manage uh, balance. You know, for this kind of situation, I need this kind of security. For this other situation, I need these other tools. And last but not least, this whole idea about not wanting to use security as a way to avoid change. I know that's not what we do here, or back where I work. But I'm telling you, there are people out there that do do that, right? They, they say things like, well, you know, I would love to go change, but, uh, you know, oh, I got this security issue, so, you know, you have to come back and catch me later, right? And, and so I would leave you with one last story as you think about, you know, how do you make sure that the products and services that you develop out here are about making sure people understand where vulnerabilities exist so they can make informed decisions, but helping them have been like the path ahead about how you actually continue to leverage new technology. There's a great story about Ford. It's sort of about like strategic leadership wherever you are in the organization. So Ford found out that the Mazda Miata, the new platform, had been developed for 360 million bucks. And at that moment in time, it was costing Ford $1.2 billion to develop a new car platform. And they were about to roll out the new Mustang. And they said, oh my gosh, we're going to have our lunch eaten. You know? Mazda is developing new car platforms for a third of the price of what it's costing us to develop a new car platform. And uh, you know, what are we going to do? So they gathered together all their engineers and put them in a room and they said, you know, I don't care how long it takes, but you go figure out how you build a Mustang for $360 million and don't come out until you do. So you know, they charted in critical path and did all sorts of stuff. And in the end, they came out and they shook their head and they said, we have no idea how Mazda developed a Miata for $360 million. Right? But we think we can do the Mustang for $500 million. And so the leadership of Ford said, all right, well, it's not 360, but it's, you know, go for it. Do it, right? And so, so they did. So they started working on the Mustang. $500 million grew to $580 million. $580 million became $650 million. And they delivered the Mustang that you now see driving around the streets. So the question for you is, were they a success or were they a failure? And again, it kind of depends on where you sit, right? Because, you know, they didn't do it for 360, right? They didn't even do it for 500. And you know how that works in our world, right? Like, what happens if you tell your boss you're going to bring the project in for 500 million and it costs 650, right? Are you, like, hardly rewarded for your efforts? <laughs> you know, not likely, right? But on the other hand, 650 million is half the cost that it would have taken had they not tried to do it differently. Now, the great punchline for this story is when the dust settled, do you know what they found out? There was no $360 million Miata. They had messed up the exchange rate. <laughs> so, now, so now this is a fascinating conundrum, right? Because this is about like arbitrary goals. Because don't we all love to like sit back and say, like, who is that loser that created that budget reduction? You know? What, where was their head when they were thinking like we could save this amount of money, right? But if you don't, wherever you are in the organization, sort of set some kind of arbitrary goals for yourself, it's really hard to get people to sort of force change. You know, we talked about Larry Ellison a little while ago. You know, Larry Ellison looked around at Oracle one day, woke up in the morning, he was taking a shower, and he said, you know, we spent too much on overhead. We need to reduce our overhead by a billion dollars. Now, when he made that decision, do you think he had any economists in the bathroom there with him? <laughs> or do you think he just kind of pulled that number out of his, uh, his pocket or something, right? And so, and so he went to work that day, and he said, you know, well, I'm the president of the company, and by gosh, I want you to all cut a billion dollars out of your overhead. Let's do it within two years. And the company worked really hard, and nine months later, they had done it. And, of course, you know what he said then, right? Another billion, right? So I would suggest to you, wherever you are, whatever you're responsible for, sometimes you've got to sort of like set some kind of target for yourself and for your workforce and that kind of stuff, or it's really hard to get people to take that first step. So, there you go. So is there anything I should have covered that I didn't? Anything that you're interested in that I didn't, or I talked so fast you have no clue what I said? Anything else that we should have talked about while you're all here together? Are you going to stay behind? Sure, I'll, I'll stay behind if you want, yeah. Because on that note, we can all escape. I am the only thing standing between all of you and happy hour, right? Or something like that. No, no, no. no. Thesis work. Okay, yeah. right. No, tonight's a trick-or-treating. All right. Well, well, enjoy the rest of your time here. And like I said, if we go to the last slide I have, um, if you could just take one more thing. This is how you find me again. This is our Don website. You, you, and this is how you find me again. My phone number and my email address. So if there's anything that you're interested in doing more or you'd like to talk about, more than, you know,